So being this the last panel of this year's forum, I wanted to take a moment to thank everyone of you who joined us here and those of you who joined us from remote. And uh, as we said uh, on the opening day last Tuesday, the forum has significantly, significantly grown since the first edition in 2017 uh, and is now structured as a not-for-profit organization. And we're very proud of this. With its members serving pro bono, all of us are serving pro bono. It has been established itself as a collaborative platform working with an extensive network of content partners and we're very grateful to them. We have engaged almost 1,000 people in Venice and dozens through our live streaming. So we want to thank again the wonderful team that has made the 2019 edition possible and all of our content partners who helped with their inspiring content and we're waiting for the last one here. So I'm going on being grateful to our donors, SMAC Gallery, something we Africans got, Investec Cape Town Art Fair, Marianne Ibrahim, and our sponsors, Strauss & Co, Sotheby's, Xenia Security, and Love Milano. We also like to thank the Edmond de Rothschild Foundations for supporting the forum with a grant. Lastly, Lupo Geronazzo Alman and Mario Geronazzo Alman, who made this auditorium possible, as well as Adriana Sozzani and Lupo Geronazzo Alman, who made our lounge possible. So we look forward to renewing our commitment to the expa expansion of conversation and perspectives on art from Africa and its diaspora in 2021. So please stay tuned for news on our next edition, and we hope to see you again in 2021. Thank you. I hope you will be all here to celebrate. So we go on with our last panel that was uh, presented in collaboration with Emerging African Art Galleries from an idea of Valerie Kabov and uh, a panel that will analyze how a pavilion in Afri in, uh, at the Venice Biennial from an African country can uh, impact not only on the economy of an artist that can go around the world and, being, uh, and work with uh, Western galleries uh, or uh, in Western museums, but can impact also and especially in the uh, country where he's from. Here with us, Frank Kilburn uh, from Strauss & Co. Ex executive chairperson at Strauss & Co. Valerie Kabov, director of the uh, uh, First for All, First for Gallery Arare, and uh, uh, founder of the Emerging African Art Galleries Network, and Hannah O'Leary, director of the Contemporary African Art Department at Sotheby's, and Janine Gael, uh, creative director at uh, Makal Marrakesh. Uh, I'll uh, give the microphone to Hannah O'Leary, who's moderating this panel, and uh, enjoy. Hi, can everyone hear me? I think everyone can hear me. Um, thank you, um, Neri, very much for the kind introduction. Thank you for everything that you've done in hosting the forum. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to moderate the final discussion and almost the conclusion of the talks this week, n no pressure. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not going to talk too much as a moderator, I just want to make sure that we guide the conversation. Um, my position is, um, I'm the head of contemporary art Contemporary Art from Africa at Sotheby's. I've been there for three years. Um, obviously, we're the, one of the biggest auction houses, one of the biggest art companies in the world, but within that, I'm the smallest department and the newest department. So it gives me great pleasure to be starting something within such an august institution. And I've been working with modern and contemporary art from the continent for almost 15 years now, which some people call me a, what was the word? Um, veteran, which I always think makes me feel ridiculously old um, and is very telling as to how 
not that it's a new field. What I like to tell is the art history of the continent, and, and I have a huge respect for those people who have been working in this field for a much longer time than me, but it does tell you kind of how quickly it's growing and how much um, in, um, attention is being paid to the continent at the moment. And I'm delighted to see you all here today. There's such interesting people in the audience. Many of you could also be on the panel with us. Um, and I'm really, really keen for you all to get involved. So we've agreed that we're going to talk for about half an hour. Um, we have a great panel with lots of different um, perspectives, both from different parts of the continent, but also different players in the art ecosystem. So there's a lot to be said. Um, but we really want to open it up to questions from the audience. So after about half an hour, we're going to do that. Um, and I'd really encourage you all to think about what you'd like to ask the panel um, and comments that you'd like to, um, to make, uh, especially as many of you have been here for many of the talks this week. And um, like I say, I think, I hope that we're, we're going to um, capitalize both on the um, presence of Africa at the Venice Biennale, but also the conclusion of the talks and the discussions that have taken place in this room. So it should make for a lively discussion, I think. Um, I'm going to ask each of the speakers here, we Neri very kindly introdu introduced us all and our titles, um, but I'd like everyone to talk just for two or three minutes about um, how you've come to, to where you are and, and what you're at, what role your institution plays um, within the contemporary African art world. Um, I'm going to start with Frank, Frank Kilborn from, from Strauss & Co. in South Africa. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, you asked us why, why we're here in why, the why preliminary discussion. So there's always a lot of reasons to be in Venice, I reckon. But uh, this is a, really a celebration of the best talent in the world, the most creative minds, and it's a wonderful opportunity to be here. For us as Strauss and Company, we are very interested in the development of the art ecosystem across Africa, and we are uh, here to, to expose our clients to what is happening in the greater world, to support the South African and African artists here, and to learn and to build networks. Uh, for myself, uh, apart from being the executive chairperson of Strauss and Company, uh, really, my passion lies with the arts. I've been an art collector long before I became involved with Strauss and & Company. And I've worked in the private sector and in government. And so it will be quite interesting for me to see how we can maximize our benefits out of Venice. And, and Valerie? Right, so it just occurred to me that um, um, the first time I ever came to Venice Biennale was in 2007, and I saw the, you know, the, unbeknownst to me, the African pavilion was controversial. I was completely unaware of the controversy. I was also uh, extremely impressed <laughs> by the work, and unbeknownst to me, it, it was complete, you know, if somebody told me at that time that two years later, less, uh, yeah, just over two years later, I'd be, you know, the, uh, establishing a gallery in Harare, uh, I would call them entirely crazy, but that's exactly what happened. So uh, Marcus Gora and I uh, established First Floor Gallery Harare in 2009, and now we're also veterans of the contemporary <laughs> art scene on the continent because we're celebrating 10 years, and for any of you who are familiar with uh, the gallery scene, the very tiny gallery scene on the continent, 10 years is a very long time. Um, then in 2016, I mean, over, uh, in addition to running the gallery, um, I'm also editor at large for Art Africa magazine, and so I'm representing, you know, the the major, the biggest uh, pan-African publication on the continent, and so part of my work at the magazine as editor at large is speaking to issues of uh, representation, access, and politics. Even though my background is actually as an art critic, uh, I believe that in there is no, you cannot start discussing quality of representation when you don't have equality of participation. And so, and finally, and with this in mind, uh, in 2016, I decided to uh, develop a Emerging African Art Galleries Association uh, as a, a we, as a network of collaboration between galleries on the continent who are, which are often working outside established infrastructures that are often working in isolation when there's only one or two galleries in 
in their own country or in their own city. There isn't a network of support, there isn't a strong market, but I always believe that together we're stronger, that you know, we might be you know, cash poor or capital poor, but we're resource rich if we collaborate and relationships are the things that drive us, uh, drive progress in our context. And so uh, that's what emerging, you know, I'm already doing my thing, yeah. right? Um, so that's, so that's, and it's what it is, it was actually one of the motivations uh, for this panel uh, to, uh, to highlight the importance of focusing on what is happening on the continent when we are meeting here in Africa, I mean in Venice, with a view of understanding the economics and infrastructure, because in the, you know, to paraphrase the absolutely immortal Kwame Nkrumah, um, and I'm paraphrasing, right, um, there is, you know, the political representation, you know, political power is null and void without economic power. So, and I think, and I think, you know, that'll be my case for Venice. I'm then. definitely going to come back to that point, because I think that's going to take us off in a whole other direction. But before I do, I want to thank Janine for joining us from Morocco. I'm sorry you couldn't be here in person, but it's really important that you are here with us. Um, Janine is the, di the um, exhibitions director of Macal in Marrakesh, which I understand is the first um, contemporary art museum on the continent, which is an incredible um, achievement that, uh, to, to, to have established that and one of, I hope, the first in many. And uh, the same question to you, Janine, maybe you can give us a little bit of background about where you're coming from and, and um, why you're on the panel today. Hi everyone, um, I'm sorry I couldn't attend physically, but uh, hopefully we'll have the chance to um, discuss all this together. And I firstly want to thank Nerit Orcello for inviting us to, um, to this talk and also for putting this important forum at the uh, Venice Biennale. And uh, as, um, as you just said, Anna, um, so I'm Janine and I'm the exhibitions director of Macal since a year and a half now. Before that, I was based in Florence, where I was operating in the art world as well, and I'm the vice president of Black History Month. I think some of you heard about Black History Month yesterday during the presentation of Justin Thompson, the founder. And uh, for me, moving to Morocco and joining the Macal Adventure was something very important, because I think what we're doing uh, is very meaningful, and as someone defined uh, we find Michael one day, a small museum with a strong character. And uh, some of you also met Maria Merad this morning, um, the RTC director. And uh, it was also important to me to join this project because it's, I think we're doing something, I mean, something different on the continent. And as Anna said, the, the project Michael is it's a unique project. And uh, behind Michael, there is a foundation, a private foundation, on the Alliance, which belongs to a Moroccan family. And uh, Michael is the, one of the latest projects of the foundation, which developed the Sculpture Park in 2013, the LCC program, the Photography Contest, and also a socially engaged uh, program called Passerelle. Uh, Miriam talked about that this morning. And uh, I think I like to define Macal as a local institution with a global vision because I think it's important uh, to first of all build a, a local audience and to build a strong local platform uh, to showcase contemporary creativity on the continent and to really build strong institutions on um, the continent. So I think. This is also why I'm very proud to be part of this amazing adventure. Thank you. Um, I think qu quite a few words and catchphrases have come up from all of our speakers, uh, one of them being ecosystem. We talk about the art world being an ecosystem. Um, there are so many players from the primary market and secondary market. I, I, I think the speakers here represent so many different factors of that ecosystem. We've got private collectors, institutional collectors, um, you know, curators, writers, and, and like I say, people who are active on both the primary and secondary markets. Um, so there are a lot of opinions and, and players here. And I guess I want to ask, and both local, global, and, and continent-wide. Um, and I want to ask what you all think, where does Venice fit into that? Why is Biennial such an important um, event in the art world calendar, and why is it important for Africa, or is it important that we're here? 
Um, I'm not going to let Valerie lead this because um, <laughs> she won't stop. So I'm going to let Frank take this one first. <laughs> I'll just make faces. You know. You'll have your time. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. It's fine. I'll, I'll build a platform for Valerie yeah. to be <laughs> controversial if she wants to be. Um, I think Venice is absolutely critical, Anna, for a number of reasons. In the first instance, um, we all know that there's been this incredible interest in African art in recent years. And it's very important in life when good fortune comes your way that you capitalize on it in a sustainable and credible way. And part of that is to participate in events such as the Biennale, where you can showcase the best artists and you can also learn and to expose yourself to some of the best minds in the world and the way in which they use their creativity to address some of the issues that we face. And if you look across the artworks that I looked at, at the Giardini and the Arsenale, there are so many uh, issues now. The previous Biennale, there was a lot of it about migration. And it's still a theme at this Biennale, but there's a lot about the environment and our interaction with the environment and the way that we, that we do it. So I think it's very important to educate oneself about the way that the world is thinking. But because the danger to African art is to become too self-obsessed with what's happening in Africa. It's very important that we understand that there are very few issues that we can own exclusively. In fact, almost every issue, whether it's colonialism, slavery, poverty, is an international issue. And there are brilliant artists all over the world working on these issues. And it's very important for us to be able to compete with them and understand how people think. So I think the first important thing is, to, is exposure. The second is that really um, the art ecosystem in Africa is, is still very small relative to other parts in the world, but it's developing rapidly. And we're very fortunate in South Africa where we've seen a, a significant increase in the number of museums. We've now, at, by the end of the year, we'll hopefully we'll have three privately funded museums to support the ecosystem, which is very important. And our galleries have been very successful in taking not only South African, but Pan-African artists into leading art fairs across the world. And where the leading art fairs are very directly monetary driven, uh, at least at, at something like the Biennale, there's a much stronger academic content and background to what is being presented and, and to be uh, what is being curated at. So I think it is absolutely critical for us to capitalize on this and to be very professional in the way that we engage with a forum such as the Biennale. I think you're hitting on some interesting points there and one that I think none of us are under any illusions that actually the Venice Biennale is a, a, ultimately a, a commercial venue. Um, it is very expensive to come to Venice both as an attendant but also as an artist and a, a country to, to host a, a pavilion, um, especially when you think about the continent, um, you know, the governments, the African governments who might be able to put public money and public support into that, the um, galleries who are representing these artists, what's the payoff for them? Um, and I think maybe this is a good time for Valerie to come in with <laughs> your point no, of I view. actually think that Frank is entirely correct, and he's entirely correct. And for me, South Africa is a prime paradigm as to why uh, wh why Venice works for South Africa, but not necessarily other national representations. And this, and and he spelt it out very beautifully: sustainability, right, and participation in the international art market, right. So. Although it's a fairly well-known fact uh, for, for you know, major participants, uh, you know, collectors and institutions in the, in the West as to how Venice operates and its connection in the art ecology or, and, uh, of you know, international art ecology, I think it is not self-evident to a lot of African uh, participations. And my argument is, is that, for instance, I think every artists in the South African pavilion this year is represented by either Stevenson or Goodman, right? And those are the only two African galleries that take part in Art Basel, right? So you will find that 40%, so I mean, I did an interesting analysis when <laughs> the list of artists came out in the major exhibition. 50% uh, of all artists participating in the curator's exhibition come from just four cities, 
Paris, Berlin, New York, and London. If you take in other American cities and other Western systems, uh, uh, cities that makes it close to 70%. Right? Only 20% of all artists come from outside the, you know, the West. In, in, you know, in the main exhibition, more than that, I think almost 100% of all artists uh, in the main exhibition are represented by galleries that participate in Art Basel and Freeze. Right. Therefore, if you, and, and that extends uh, to the national pavilions also. There, there's a very strong economic reason, and economics extraordinarily. My background is also in cultural economics and law. I mean, there, you know, I've had three or four different lives before, before <laughs> immersing myself in art, uh, you know, and I will become a Marxist eventually. But the main, <laughs> the point to be made here is is this: that if you don't have, if you don't have, if you are not participating in the market systems, uh, what a national pavilion is achieving for an African state is is extremely poor value for money. And what what you what has happened and what happens is that you are create you are providing your your national cultural budget uh, towards marketing of artists that will be picked up by Western galleries who will take the the economic benefit of uh, of your you know of your investment because the taxes that galleries pay from sales you know from their commission sales go to fund the paving on the roads in London. And quite frankly, I live in Harare, our roads need a lot more paving work than that. And I think these, these are crucial economic questions mm -hmm. that can't be, can't, we can't begin addressing issues of quality and community building until we do solve issues of structural economic uh, equality. And I think, you know, Janine would actually have something to contribute on that as well. Right. I think also um, we, we have three interesting speakers here in that the, your local um, uh, representation here at, at Venice is so very varied. You know, South Africa have a long and, and interesting history at, at, at the Venice Biennale, interrupted, absolutely. Um, and like you say, there, there's a strong economic reason for those um, galleries to, to participate here. You've got, ben or you've got Zimbabwe who have been consistent here in the last five years, despite all the odds perhaps. Um, and then Janine, um, you know, we just mentioned that uh, you're, you're in Morocco. Morocco has never had a pavilion at, at, at Venice. What, what does that mean and, and um, what would you like to see, how would you like to see Morocco participate in the biennial if, if they do at all? Hello, um, I'm sorry I couldn't um, could you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, because the connection is very, very bad. Okay. Um, I was saying, I'm um, sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear um, all the all the responses. But uh, regarding Morocco, I think uh, has. I think. I mean. The Venice Biennale is a very important uh, rendezvous in the art world. It's the most important Biennale in the world. And uh, yes, it's quite curious that Co uh, has never participated to the Art Venice. I mean, have participated to the Architecture Biennale, but um, to, the, um, to the Art Biennale, not yet. And uh, But what I also wanted to point out is, um, it's, I think, before uh, seeking a participation to the Venice Biennale, it's also very important to, first of all, uh, build, as like I was saying earlier, build a um, very strong local institution. Because I think a participation to the Venice Biennale has to mirror the state of the, has to mirror uh, the condition and the state of the cultural scene locally. And I think now, I mean, Morocco has been, has been um, a strong platform since many years, and uh, the strength it, at, in doing that is also, I mean, it's also growing, because now uh, we have uh, the Macal in Marrakech, I mean, the foundation, the Fondation Alliance, is being acting since 10 years, and uh, by supporting artists and supporting projects um, about Africa all over the world. And uh, we have several institutions um, in Morocco, uh, in Marrakesh, in Casablanca, and everywhere. 
and Marrakesh also will be the um, uh, cultural capital, African cultural capital of culture in 2020. And uh, I think it's it will come at some point because I think, and I'm I'm pretty convinced that now Morocco is ready, but to I mean make that move and have a pavilion at the Venice Biennale. The, th the thing with the Venice Biennale is it's um, the I mean it's not. It has the initiative of the country, not singular institution. So to have that presence, because now in Morocco, most of the institutions, I mean, we have public institutions, but many um, acting, um, acting institutions are private. So we're trying you know, to work together, and I think by joining forces, it will be easier to, you know, um, be, I mean, think about the presence of the Moroccan pavilion and the Venice Finale. But locally, something is happening, and it's, for me, it's, I mean, it's most of all important to, um, to uh, I mean, to develop an audience locally before thinking, I mean, thinking global and uh, thinking, at, thinking the Venice Finale. And uh, I want to quote something uh, Simon Jamie was saying in 2017 when uh, they opened the African Pavilion at the, at the Venice Biennale. There was a huge controversy around that. And to, I mean, to defend the project, it was saying uh, why um, a country should put like four times of its cultural budget to rent a location at the Venice Biennale when maybe they can develop some other, some other department uh, locally or strengthen the cultural scene locally. So I also think, and in this case, I'm not only talking about Morocco, because I'm also French and Cameroonian, and Cameroon has a lot of intellectuals, a lot of curators, we everywhere, everywhere. I mean, Koyoko just joined the, uh, she's just uh, just joined the Zaid um, in South Africa, but we don't have any, any presence at the Venice Biennale as a pavilion. So I think it's, the most important is, to think local first, and then uh, when we will join forces with the, the private and the public, we will make it to the Venice Biennale. But it has to be the will of the countries. So you've touched on the other half of this argument. How do we, we've already spoken about um, participating in Venice. This is an incredibly expensive um, uh, pro project or, or um, for, for countries to get involved in, and it makes sense in some instances where there are monetary factors where, as we said before, everyone is here, they'll go on to Basel, they'll buy all of the artists who participated in Venice, the galleries have made back their money. Um, how do we, in the African art space, how do we capitalize on the African participation in Venice? How do we bring that economy, that creative economy, back to the continent. And, and as you said, Janine, how do you um, explain to your, your local audience why Venice is important? Um, I think, um, how to explain, I mean, the, the, the... Could you still hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay, sorry. Um, to explain the, the importance of uh, an attendance to the Venice Biennale to the local audience. It's first of all to um, to uh, to educate the local audience audience to the importance of the art and culture in a society, and from that you can I mean you can extend the you, you can extend that to uh, an attendance to the Venice Biennale because I think the impact and I'm, I'm, I will try like a very weird comparison. Uh, between like football and art, and we just had an exhibition at the Monde Arabe, now football and Monde Arabe, and I think football is something that brings bring the people together so easily, and I think if we reach the point when art will bring the communities together and it won't be something, it will stop to be something um, exclusive, but mostly something inclusive, that will be easier to, I mean, to reach also the local audience and to support the participation of a national pavilion at the Venice Biennale. So um, 
I, um, so I think, yes, uh, when, for example, when uh, what we do at Macal, we do a lot of, uh, we organize a lot of rendezvous with the local communities because, first of all, I mean, we mo first of all, it's important to, to, uh, to make the community, I mean, not to make them because we're not forcing anyone, but it's important to, uh, to, uh, to have, I mean, to make our audience understand what, what we're doing. And as soon as we reach that point, it will be, yes, easier to, uh, to say, okay, now we have to go bigger and we can, I mean, even if it's a national initiative, maybe if private um, entities join forces, I mean, it would be easier to, uh, I mean, to, um, to, come on, bien encore, de, de, de parler d'une voix commune, to speak like with a common voice, and yes, it has to be, the community has to have the will, I mean, to be there, and uh, and I think, like I said earlier, the, the Venice attendant has to be the mirror of what is happening locally. That's such a good point. I think it's a uh, like, really, really important point you're making, but also that there has to be, I don't know, just, I will just chip in. Please. As I would. I was coming uh, to you next. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think it's really, it's really important that what you, what Janine is pointing out, that there needs to be a local weight, and that, and this kind of, and the mirroring between what is presented in Venice and what is happening locally. That, and one of the reasons I believe that we haven't had that sustainability, and you know, Frank, you know, I think the word sustainability is extraordinarily important here, is that why we haven't had consistency of participation from African countries, you know, Nigeria came, came yes, last year, and, uh, and if you are going to talk about uh, you know, uh, financial means, Niger you know, Nigeria should have been, you know, right up there and, and very consistent, but there hasn't been that mirroring happening of, uh, and, and it's, of, I mean, it's also very interesting, just I'll speak from the perspective of First Floor Gallery Harari of how, what happened for us is that we were going, we started going to art fairs since 2012, right? And so over time, we were in a tiny space, like in a very, you know, a very humble space, which never received, you know, we don't have a local market, so we never felt the pressure of being visible or a mirror. And then over time, as our presentation internationally grew and we developed weight, we felt the burden to uh, mirror that in our local environment because we started having collectors being interested and international audiences coming to see. And I think uh, the other point to be made is that uh, African art scenes need to have local weight and and a presence and and the international visitors. You need to shift, in order, if, in order to shift uh, the center of, and the periphery, yes, please, Neri. <laughs> uh, we need to actually physically shift those centers as long as Africans are merely always going to plead their case in Europe and say, look at us, look at us. It's sort of, no one in Africa needs to be looked at. You know, it's like if you want to see art, and Janine also made the point is that art needs to be understood in its own context. When you remove art so radically from its own context and understanding, especially since there's so much ignorance of African cultures in the West, extreme. Every time we travel, we see how, how much ignorance there is. It's, it, it makes a profound difference for people to see art uh, in its own context. So I think it's crucial for, for Venice to be an opportunity to bring people to, to the continent and there needs to be a credible, uh, you know, a credible, I guess, uh, what is it called? A critical mass of events and opportunities for people to come to the continent, not just the predictable places. South Africa has really explored and, and activated that base and I think it creates a model in its own way. I mean, you know, South Africa is a peculiar example, right, on the continent. Let's just leave it at that. Singular. <laughs> Singular. Singular. <laughs> Singular. But, but I think it is, but it, but it is an example that reflects the structure of, of the international market. And I'll just do a plug for what we're doing. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, so with the Emerging African Art Galleries Association, we developed, well, how do we create, a, a, for a, 
an opportunity for people to engage with art scenes that we come from that are very underexplored and are very difficult to attract attention to from the international press. That's the other thing, is that if there's any press in the room, you really need to be writing about things outside the predictable centers, right? And so we've created the Emerging uh, uh, Painting in Invitational, which is a, an emerging painting prize, which, uh, and the first edition will take place in Harare at the end of July this year, and it's a, it's an, I'm gonna interrupt yeah. you for a second because I really want to come to, back to that. Before we do, though, I really want to talk to Frank about um, literally what he's doing here this week. I mean, you're not just here to speak on this panel. Um, why is it important for you, for your company, to be a sponsor of this event? And maybe you can tell us about, um, you're here with a group of collectors. Why, why, why bring South African collectors to the Venice Biennale? What does that mean for you and, and your group? Well, I think what Janine said is very true. If, if art is a priority in your own country, people will allocate resources to it. And the only way that uh, your African countries have got a lot of demands on their, on their funds. There's, you know, uh, often art is very low on the list of priority of government, albeit that it's a complete underestimation of the transformative power of art. And we will much rather throw money at the soccer stadium than in terms of promoting art. But I always say you judge a country by how it treats its artists. And so we can't wait for governments to change. Governments have to be made to change. And so how do we bring that to bear? And I'll answer your question indirectly, and I'm getting to that, is that we effectively form public-private sector partnerships. Because, um, you know, uh, as Valerie said, if, if galleries have an incentive to uh, support the government's efforts because they know the artists are going to benefit through it, it's also, uh, that's the sort of capitalism in a, in a sort of naked way functioning. But if you look across Venice, you'll see a number of philanthropic institutions that ultimately were born out of capitalism that are actually supporting the effort. So what you need to do, in my mind, is to have a collaborative effort between people who are directly interested in art because they benefit from it financially, people who are interested in art because they think it's very important for, for the country and for themselves, for people to be exposed to art, then working together with governments to, to enable them to get a platform to come to a place like Venice and represent the country. But what is then important is that the whole process, how you select your artists, must be very transparent, very open. And what you do subsequent to Venice in terms of taking those artists and the achievements at Venice back home and publicizing it and everything, that is also very important. And I think in that instance, many African countries have shot itself in the foot. To be honest, they spend a lot of money here with no follow-up back home, so people don't see the value of it. Why should we reinvest? It doesn't become a priority, and it doesn't draw private collectors and, and philanthropists into the effort to say, this is really important for us, it's really important for our national psyche, uh, that's why we need to allocate capital to it. So from a Strauss point of view, we believe in the end that um, we need to participate across the African the market and we would like to broaden the number of works that we bring to our auctions and also broaden the audience that we present works to. So coming to Venice is an ideal opportunity for people to, to understand what is happening in the board world out there, but also to see how well African artists are actually competing and uh, on, on such an important forum. So I think it's an educational process and in the end hopefully it will add to that public-private philanthropic partnership that we need in order for us to present ourselves on these international fora in a more effective way. I think you've, you've again hit on some interesting points that will bring us forward. That word education is something that I feel I spend a lot of time doing in comparison to my peers within my company. Um, this is a field where there is a small group of people who have been active a long time and there is a huge group of people who are interested and need that education. Um, and I'm really interested to hear from all of you about how, how, where is the follow-up? What do you do next to bring the international art community who are here, here this week back to, to your country or your um, area of interest, um, geographical area of interest? Um, what, what next? What, what, what's the plan, Frank, for bringing the international art world to, yes, a very easy, accessible, touristy country, but bringing the serious art world to South Africa to in investigate the art world there? Well, this year was a little bit different to our previous participation where we created the Friends of the Venice of the South African Pavilion, 
and a number of role players were involved and uh, in the process of just part being part supportive, part owning of the South African effort, and then afterwards really publicised what happened. And I think this year, until three months before it happened, we barely knew whether we were going to be here or not, which is sort of an uh, inimitable way. And as we Africans have uh, to shoot ourselves in the foot, but we are here, and so it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that we that we expose what happened here and carry the message forward. So. Um, if, you, if I can just look, for example, at, at the Ghanaian uh, pavilion that opened yesterday. I don't know who of you were there, but I think it was absolutely superbly done. And what did they do from a business point of view that were very clever? Is that they announced several months ago that the leaning design and architect is going to build their stand. Then they got their top three or four artists to be present to, to make major works for, specifically for, for the pavilion. And they were all there yesterday, present. Uh, accessible, talking about their work, promoting. So I think that's an incredible impression. So if I were them, I would go back, put it on my national radio, on TV, you know, on shows, have follow-up. And we, I mean, they did a fantastic job. They, they created the fantastic platform for them to, to populate their message. So it's really uh, on us to, to put the pressure and sometimes to do it ourselves as a private sector, to give that momentum if government does it, do it. And I look forward to the opening of the South African Pavilion uh, tonight as well, and hopefully we can replicate something to that effect. So it's really, um, you, we, uh, we are, don't have the luxury to wait for governments to do things for us. We actually have to help them do it, force them do it, and put it on the national agenda in ways that we can. And, uh, and we will do it at Strauss by including some of these artists in our auctions, by doing educationals to expose people about it, to tell them about it, and I think Everyone in the, in the art ecosystem back home have to buy into what your country is doing at Venice. Why it's important, even if it's not my gallery's artist that's going. And for that you need transparency, you know, and a whole sort of process. And I don't think we have come near to optimizing any of those. Valerie, maybe you can no. come back to your well, upcoming project. Well, yeah, sure. And I think, I think this, uh, I mean, again, like sustainability, education and transparency that has to be happening back home in order to maintain quality of participation and you know and 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 its meaning right and and so i think and i think this is also one of the reasons we're doing the emerging painting prize is because it is really you know and it's exactly what frank said we can't wait for government to do it we just have to take uh, the initiative and uh, it's it's been very important for us to actually highlight visual art to the local community in Harare and present it as an opportunity for celebration and for celebration of international excellence of Zimbabwean contemporary artists, uh, which is actually not visible at all to the general population, right? So it's because, again, there are other cultural priorities for Zimbabwe, there's other you know, economic priorities, and so I think a lot of the visibility that is received internationally, and we've been very conscious of it as First Floor Gallery Harare, that, that we've shifted our exhibition priorities to focus on major exhibitions by our internationally visible artists in Harare to create that momentum and also to, and we're developing the prize also as an opportunity to invite collectors and that's what we're doing here, we're plugging. <laughs> and we all, and I see Venice, I think for private actors actually, for non-national actors, there's, Venice is a great opportunity that, which with a lot of flexibility, right? And a lot of value add in that sense. And I've been coming to Venice before before it was, you know, it, before I was invested in the continent. So I think I think it's really crucially important to create to create structured opportunities, especially because there's so many barriers to entry uh, when people think of coming to Africa. Like the number of questions we have to field from visitors. You know, do I need injections? You know, how much? You know. Uh, like, like the fears are great, so so creating safe opportunities for visiting Africa definitively important. So we've we've made one. <laughs> um, Janine, I imagine this is um, a topic you can speak to us all day about. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing with Macal um, on the same subject with um, uh, engaging your audience and and um, attracting a, a wider audience? Okay, um, first of all, I will, um, wait. Okay. first of all, um, I think I will, um, 
I will, I will, I will respond to Frank because I joined him when he was talking about the, the, pub, the private and the public, um, and how the private can influence the private actors can influence the public actors, and I think that's the key word actually. That's the most important thing. Um, and I will take as an example, uh, like I said earlier, Marrakesh will be the African, the cultural uh, African um, capital in 2020. And I was, I attended one of the committee meeting, and I know the initiative actually was was good. It's coming from a private uh, private actors, and they brought the ideas and the project to uh, to uh, to the local institution, to the national institutions, and. Uh, and, uh, and they found the project interesting, and this is how they, en they embraced the project. And now Marrakesh will be that, um, that um, African capital of culture. So yes, it's really important to, I mean, to put the work together. And yes, private institution can be uh, such as us, because also Macal and Fondation, we we private entities, and private institutions can, uh, kind of like. Lead, not lead the path, but maybe show the path in a certain way, and uh, convince the 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 I mean the national uh, institutions that attending to uh, to the Venice Finale it's something it's an incentive it's something very important for the visibility and of the country and it's something um, a country has to do at some point, especially Morocco, which. Which is a platform for the contemporary art scene in, in in the Maghreb and in the French, I mean in the in the African country, and for us um, has to uh, to build and raise and educate an audience. It's uh, it's uh, it's something. I mean, it's ninety percent. It's ninety percent of our work actually because uh, it's. It's not that easy. It's um, like Macal uh, opened in 2016 during the COP 22nd, first of all. And um, and when Macal opened, I mean, the aim was to showcase the collection of the family Azraq, which is the family behind the foundation. And since 2016, we have uh, raised our, our public. I mean, we have an international audience, but we also have a local audience first because. We try to uh, not to impose a vision, but first of all to understand who is our audience, who are we talking to. So um, for us, it was important to have the local communities uh, as an audience at Michael, and we did. When we we still working on it, but now we, I mean, we kind of have a circle of public audience, and this is how we started. For example, the couscous and art. Which is uh, an initiative we, we started more than a uh, year and a half a year, a year ago, uh, because we um, it was important to us to speak the language of the masses. And Taha Benjelun uses to say that like uh, cultural professional and cultural institution, the most in, and even artists, the most important thing is to speak the language of the masses. So by inviting uh, the local communities to share couscous at the Macal at the museum. On a Friday, and um, before sharing the meal, we organize a guided tour of the exhibition in Arabic or in French or in English, depends on the communities we have, because we, have, we receive the Senegalese community and uh, the, some local neighborhoods, um, some neighborhoods in Marrakesh, and some non-profit associations. So, according to the audience, we adapt to the audience, and so this is. What we're doing, trying first of all to understand the need of the community. We will be hosting the tour because this is uh, the Ramadan started on Monday in uh, in Morocco, so it's a uh, it's a whole month uh, where you also have to adapt uh, the way you operate. And we'll be hosting next week the tour, the tour and art, which is an initiative uh, that bring all the communities and artists and professionals together in the Garden of Macal. And break the fast, the fasting together. So that's, I think, that's the kind of thing it's important to do. To first of all understand the needs of the people you're talking to. Thank you so much. I think it's a nice opportunity to open it up to questions. I hope there are lots of questions from the audience. And um, we've been talking 
a little bit much. Um, who is there a microphone going around, or does anyone have any questions? I wondered a bit about the PR effect um, at home. And one of the things, this is my first time, and one of the things that's very striking is some outstanding women artists. And I think of countries where women are marginalized or perhaps um, Islamic countries where women artists face more barriers. I just wonder, can you give some examples? That is that part of the idea that actually Venice is cutting edge in terms of providing opportunities for women artists? Is that directed at anyone in particular? I, I, one of my favorite um, facts about the African art market is that actually women dominate. So in every corner of the continent, it's, it, women outsell men several times over. The top selling artist in Nigeria is Entedeka Akineli Crosby. We've sold her for 3.5 million as opposed to the closest male artist, which is 1 million. Um, it's the same in Kenya with Wangeshi Mutu. It's the same in Ethiopia with uh, Julie Moretu. It's the same in South Africa with Marlene Dumas. At the same time, I think that's also very telling. These are all artists who live in the diaspora. None of those artists live and work on the continent. Um, so it's a really interesting question about whether um, there is, I think in the, in the international art market at the moment, it's not an African um, issue. There is a big push for uh, gender, um, the, the diversity within ethnicity, geography, eth um, sexuality, and, and gender as well. Um, but Africa does kind of present some interesting issues on, on that front. Um, and I think it, m my, my point earlier is also one that is a resounding problem with um, the African art market and, and with Venice. Um, how do we, when we talk about African art, how do we bring it back to the continent? How do we retain our talent and nurture the talent and nurture the market on the continent and make sure that um, we're we have African artists for African collectors and we have a, a lively ecosystem on the continent and not just lose, lose talent to those cities that Valerie already uh, mentioned. I, w I mean, I would add to that is that actually in Zimbabwe we were very fortunate that the vast majority of artists who have become internationally known have chosen to stay in Zimbabwe, which I find like I, I'm, I'm enormously proud of. I'm, enormously proud of because there is also uh, there is a very unkosher sort of sentiment that says that all the best artists will gravitate to all the best cities the best cities being New York, LA, you know Paris and London and Berlin which I find deeply offensive uh, both to the creativity and the importance of that creativity and so and this sort of speaks to the numbers you're talking to about and to the point where Ralph Rugoff in an interview very deeply offensively said that we have when they who was asked also offensively are there any Africans in his exhibition he said yes we have some wonderful artists we have an Ethiopian artist Julie Merritt we have a a Nigerian artist in Judeca. Uh, we have, um, you know, a uh, Kenyan artist, Michael Armitage, who's based in London for most of it. And then uh, who was, uh, and we have some lovely South African artists. Uh. I think, but I think again that we, we need to turn that question on its head and say, what are we doing to make that, mm. make changes on that front? And some of those artists are make, doing some really interesting things. So Michael Armitage, um, you know, brought what, 50 different artists from the continent Together, to yeah. um, Nairobi last year for a residency. Yinka Shonabara, who's a British artist who, a British Nigerian artist, um, returned to Nigeria only quite recently for, to exhibit for the first time. He's built in a, a, a residency to bring international artists to the continent to just, um, create discourse um, in Nigeria. Um, uh, Julie, or not Julie, but um, Wangeshi Mutu is now um, splits her time 50-50 between Kenya and, and, and New York. Um, so there are, there are agents of change, there are people who are making things happen. I think happen. artists are actually showing that kind of thought leadership that market can't be, and as I mentioned, Ibrahim, like Ibrahim in his talk, is I think it's really important that actually the market is not a, a role model or a thought leader in that regard, but the artists can be and often are, and I salute the artists. Claude has a question.
on, on, your, on this issue of um, the tension between the diaspora and continental Africa. So on my uh, platform, True Africa Today, I published an interview with Amina Zubir, who's leading um, this kind of fake, real Algerian pavilion. And so the most interesting thing about the interview was she said that the Algerian diaspora, mainly in France and the UK, was able to lobby the transition government in order to pull, have the funds pulled from the Algerian pavilion. And so she says that there's a real issue between Algerians living in Algeria and experienced Algerian as it is now, who feel like they are the legitimate uh, custodians of the current uh, Algerian experience, and those in the diaspora who have maybe more means, more grants, more scholarships, and maybe more influence in the media, and they can pull more strings. So my, my question is a, is a big one. How do we reconcile the diaspora with continental Africa when obviously the diaspora has maybe more money, more influence, more power in some of these decision-making instances? Does anyone want to jump in? Can somebody from the floor answer? <laughs> <laughs> I think we, in the first... Well, you planted him. <laughs> we should not forget that artists always moved. You know, Picasso created some of his greatest works while living in France. Mondrian created his best works while living in, in London. Same with Duchamp with, in New York. Same with Duchamp. So artists that move from place to place uh, is a historic phenomenon. So I think we must accept that. The second thing is um, what the best way we can counter that is by developing a local continental collector base. The more important collectors we have that can compete with international collectors for the attention of gallerists, the more emphasis will, there will be on artists to produce works that those collectors are interested in, present it to them in ways and follow it up with them in ways that engage them. So it's a big challenge for all the institutions like ourselves, yourselves, yourselves, that in the primary and the secondary mod is to build a much, much stronger collection. Made. Far too many of our works are made for the market outside the continent, by artists living outside the continent, sold outside the continent, and not really celebrated uh, to the extent that they should be inside the continent. So that's really a challenge that we all have to embrace and we all have to commit to change. Because it's, it's as logical as that. I mean, you can ask artists to be philanthropic, but they, they also want to excel, they want to be internationally known, they want to be financially successful, so they will most likely go where they can find those sort of things. So the stronger collector base we build, the more academic institutions we build that the artists can engage with, that value and critique their work, and the more important those aspects become, the more inclined people will be to live and work in the continent. And things. So. I, I agree. I think actually those lines are starting to blur. It's not always a question of in Africa and uh, versus the diaspora, you know, as you say, artists move around and have always done so. And we need to make sure that there is reason for artists to re retain their practice on the continent and, um, you know, the structure for them to operate within that system. I went to the Zimbabwe opening yesterday, and, and forgive me, I cannot remember the name of the artist's name, but he was saying, you know, just getting this, the, the materials to create his work in... Um, uh, no, the photographer. Uh, Neville. Yeah, he was saying just, just getting those, those printing papers to, um, to a studio is, you know, it costs 10 times more than if he was a, an, an artist in Europe. There are, there are practical reasons why artists often tr travel for, for, um, for making their art, for engaging in the art or, um, the discourse. And, and I guess what we need to make sure is that discourse is also equally attractive on the continent, that there, are, that there is that practice. But, but I, I mean, I have to just interject with one tiny statement is that one of the most inspiring, inspiring things that I've ever heard that I remind myself when things get really difficult is, um, I think it was in 2011, uh, we were doing a discussion and one of, and 2011, I mean, Zimbabwe has never had a really good time, not in my experience, things have been tough, but one of our painters, Wycliffe Mundopa, who was a kid at the time, really, uh, he would have been like 22, 23, and he said, the suffering is what makes us. And so he chose to remain in Zimbabwe and when many other artists left because it, he felt it was his job to bear witness and to speak the story of his people and you can't do that from the outside. And that I think answers your question about the diaspora and agency and 
you can't, you know, there are certain things that, you know, it depends on how you see your job as an artist. And I think Marcus wanted to say something controversial. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just really wanted to say that. Uh, t yeah, 10 years ago, I was 25 uh, with, with 100 bucks, and we started a gallery, right? And the deck is so stacked against emerging artists, so much so that if you're an emerging artist on the continent, to quickly dramatize, you don't have a good art school. You don't have good materials. And then Venice comes into the, uh, into the picture as the thing that is taking a lot of money from the budget that could be a government budget or any other sort of institutional budget to support the local infrastructure straight into an event that has enough PR, enough press. The, the conversation that is had with the ministry is the same as saying, oh, it's the same as sending the volleyball team to the Olympics. So give money to it, right? You give soccer teams, you give blah. Now you can give art teams, you bring your ambassador, they make a speech in Venice. Lights, camera, action. But back at home, these artists don't have the same passport as the, as the diaspora artists, right? Who can travel, we need visas, you need, um, uh, if you don't have a degree program like we do in Zimbabwe, you can't get into residencies, you can't get, there's a glass ceiling already as to how far you can progress. You can't become a teacher, you can't become other things. So the deck is hev heavily stacked and when people talk about participation in Venice, it does add to the flavor of something that is already established, something that is already big galleries, big uh, infrastructures and ecosystems that are already working. And for young countries, uh, small countries with real problems, big problems, it's, it's, the priorities are a, a bit messed up. I, I, I'm not saying this to slight the people who make the effort. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, 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 such a huge effort and, and it is probably important, but they are going to run out of field very soon. It's very evident. When you say participation is spotty, is because there is no chain from graduating people who have the quality, both practically and, and theoretically, to, to carry it at that level. Uh, and you run out of field. You do one big pavilion this year, but those artists have spent years and years nurturing their practice, doing all these things. Next year, those people might not be there. And we're talking about even the biggest participants because who next is gonna come if there's no conveyor belt that is properly structured to, at every stage, fuel and oil uh, such a machine. So I don't know, I, I just feel like for the emerging artists, uh, participation, and, and half the people don't even know, right? And that's the reality of it. In the countries that these people come from, they don't know because it's not, it's not a democratic process. All right? There's no transparency. Somebody convinces, somebody lobbies, somebody pushes, pitches, and they get a budget. And when they go back, it's really difficult. There's no feedback, there's, there's nothing. And a lot of, I mean, Zim statistics, and I'll give them away. The past few years, maybe 20 artists came to Venice. Only five would have been picked up by a gallery from London or South Africa, right? None are back in Zimbabwe, uh, Zimbabwean galleries, right? Uh, and they hardly even show in Zimbabwe anymore because no one is going to be able to, they have a contract that doesn't allow them to do it or nobody is able to pay for it. So not only is the art going away, it always does, but it can't be seen in those countries again. So the, it's really stark and I don't know where to, to begin. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and so it will take more of an effort to do stuff on the continent uh, more events. I mean, there are art fairs where they are doing very well. There are museums. There are going to be galleries. And I think that that's where maybe the focus is going to be uh, to be important. Venice is going to be a highlight, but I don't know. I'm not sure what we are highlighting. Thanks. Thank you so much. I think you summarized the, the, the bigger issue at stake here. Janine, go ahead. Yes, um, I will. Um, I want to. I, w I also want to respond to uh, about the reconciliation between the diaspora and, uh, and the continent. I think it's also important to point something out. First, I mean, I will join the gentleman who just, who just spoke by saying, I mean, an artist, first of all, evolving on the continent or train on the continent, maybe doesn't have the same access to uh, infrastructures or art schools as an artist uh, evolving abroad. But um, I think also what we are doing, Frank, Valerie, by you know reinforcing the institution, as I was talking earlier, 
makes I mean it makes us also have um, an international uh, to be like seen as professional internationally. Because for example, now at Macal in the show we have now material insanity we have more than 30 artists from the continent but from the diaspora as well we have work of Nari Ward we have Adrian Piper in Marrakesh we have uh, some artists from I mean they are African American artists and we have artists from the diaspora too and I think it's I won't, I won't even say an ongoing process because I mean the artists from the diaspora also are seeing what's going on in the continent and they want to be part of it with 154 in Marrakesh you have uh, galleries coming from abroad showing in Marrakesh with the Biennale in Dakar. You have, I mean, a reunion of the local artists and the international artists. And if we even take an example such as Ibrahim Mahama, which is a Ghanaian artist living, um, born and raised and still living in Ghana and is being attending maybe, I don't, we don't count anymore his attendance at the Venice Biennale. He just did a massive installation at, uh, at, uh, in Milan and on Porta Venezia. So it's, I mean, there's something going on. And I think the artists from the diaspora also are seeing that and they want to be part of what's going on on the continent too. I remember when we were working on, uh, on a show last year and an artist from the diaspora reached me and she wanted to be part of the, of the, of the show and has, the, has one of the arguments, she said, I have, um, I have Algerian roots. So it's uh, according to what we're also offering as um, institutions and implanted locally on the continent, the artists will follow. The artists will follow. So I think it's, yes, it's an ongoing conversation. Okay. I, yeah, I think that's absolutely correct. I think we could talk about this for, for hours to come, but sadly we've overrun. Um, so I want to thank my panelists very much for their contribution. I think this is an ongoing discussion that we we will need to continue in 2021, Neri. Um, and thank you all very much for, for coming in and for your great questions. Thank you. Thank you.